I'm recording. I ain't playing no bullshit here. There you go. I got Ron Thomas, Speed Racer. <laughs> How you doing, brother? I am the real deal. <laughs> I'm good, man. How you doing today? I, I'm good. I was trying to think when I met you, and I was so confused because yes. we met at Wind Down Wednesday, right? Or was that? Wind Down Wednesday at um, uh, the Dragonfly. Dragon, But... Did I come with Tarsus or were you with Tarsus? <laughs> or did we Tarsus, just Tarsus invited me to come? He says, My boy's birthday is out, so why don't you just come hang out? And I said, Yeah, why not? I wasn't doing anything that night. So um we met you and everything and everything was it was great. Oh, that was a blast. I got confused that day because I know we were all kind of there together, a bunch of us. I didn't know who I didn't know if I came with Tarsus, met you and Tar I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Oh man, I love Tarzis. Um, yeah. He's a good guy, man. Good guy. He's I haven't heard from him for so long. Oh, I got him. I'm going to kick his ass. We normally do every year the margarita ball together. This year he passed. Nice. Uh, but we went to his wow. wife's. Last year we went to his wife's. Um, was it a surprise party? Which was wonderful. Okay. And then he invited nice. me to the MMA fights at the arena. Me and him went. And, nice. you know, it was great. Uh, you know, I was just talking to a friend of ours, a mutual friend. I, I, I posted it today, um, Mordecai Williams, and he owns yep. Arm Sports. I know Mordecai. Yeah. yeah. So I love Mordecai, and I met uh, Mordecai through um, Tarsus. And I yes. was thinking I've known these two guys going on two decades now, how time flies. It I know. Sounds, time flies. That's the truth. It's unbelievable how that uh, worked out because Tarzis did. And when, when I started my clothing line, that's how I became really close with him. He helped design all right. my clothing line from top to bottom. Which, Definitely. Which was awesome. So Making you snazzy. So I see your videos and everything, and you're always on top of your game when it comes to the fashion thing. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me this last year. I went more uh, athletic wear. I'm exhausted from fashion. <laughs> When I travel, I <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but let's start with you and me and you. Uh, well, not me. My father and you are car. You guys are car aficionados. I guess you would say you love cars. You work in the yeah, industry. That's my passion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You work in the industry. Yeah. And we don't have to get involved yes. with you know what component. No, that I'm okay with it. I don't. Give I'm a okay shit. with it. But the, the, for for me, it's. I always tell people either you're a car guy or a car salesperson. Mm -hmm. I hate to be called a car salesperson because you know, the stigma, same thing like attorneys, you know, the bottom feeders. But, um, <laughs> as a car guy, I can <laughs> that's what they say. And I conduct um, myself a little differently. Mm -hmm. And, um, being as passionate as I am about cars, it makes me, it makes it easier for me to help people place them in the right, what they're looking for. If they're telling me driving dynamics, um, needs and benefits and all that stuff so um i use my passion to help me become successful in my business yeah and i don't think there's anything worse for me as going to buy a car to car dealership that's no disrespect to you i just get nuts with them with the bullshit you know the old timers yes. like my father my grandfather they seem to like that um, that back and forth neg negotiating i'm not I'm, <laughs> yeah i don't have the patience for that um and I, I, even, I don't. I, oh, it's, I've called, even in front of my kids, car dealerships, jag offs. I've threatened, I mean, I got nuts at car dealerships. Yeah. Um, well, I know, I know. So anyways, we're going to get into that later. But what I want to get into you, sure. with you is, you know, your obsession with Porsches and obviously Ferraris yes. and car yeah. shows. Because I even run into you at some car shows with my father. We ran into each sure. other at Celebration. That's an unbelievable show. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So and my the guy who, who threw that show, he's a good friend of mine, and um, that's um, Spiro. And I never knew that he was the one that conducted that show out in Celebration. It's uh, every last Saturday of the month. And um, he was coming across a six-month anniversary, so I'm very involved in the car community and such. So he says, Ron, I'm, you know, I'm always averaging about 20 people. Do you think you can help me out? And I said, sure. Sent some email out. I think we got 80 people there. All exotic cars, supercars. It was fantastic. So you're telling me at Celebration right now, they're doing that every month? Because I only know about the Make-A-Wish once a year. Oh, I didn't know that. No. 
Every last Saturday of the month. Every last Sunday of the month. I'm sorry, not Saturday. Sunday of the month. Every last – I got to tell my father because he loves Absolutely. that show when he brings his car. He yeah. wins awards. At, he just won his last award at uh, Davenport. He won best. Oh, okay. He won, they yeah. had their own private one downtown. It was very quaint. and mm-hmm. I got to tell him about this celebration thing because he loves the show. It's celebration. Everyone loves it. Well, it's not, well it's not a celebration. It's at um, Old Town. Oh, you do the old, yeah, my father. We go to the yeah, old yeah, town. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. I, I went to, I met, that's right. I ran into you in the celebration show that time. But in Old Town, everyone knows they do the motorcycles and the um, hot rods on Saturdays. Sure. But every last, sa- every last Sunday of the month, Spiro organizes the exotic car show there. And that's yeah. on Old Town where the big Ferris wheel is. So there's no confusion. Yeah, I've been in that numerous times. I've done videos on that. And I used to even know Frogger's yeah. open up there. I used to hang out with the owner from Frogger's, George. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. was cool. And um, I also love Celebration because my buddy runs, uh, helps with the hotel there. What's that hotel there? Yeah. There's one downtown Orlando. What is that? It's a beautiful hotel. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure. God. Dang it, I forget about it. But that's a beautiful hole. If, if you're watching this, if you ever get a chance, you definitely want to visit Celebration, even though Disney kind of removed itself from there. Because I've been going there from its infancy, and it was always, it still looks like Disney to a certain degree, but it's definitely changed. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's, you mainly have Porsches, but you're a funny person because you love Ferraris. So um, I've, both. all my life, I've been a Ferrari enthusiast and ca- until I came to the point and said, it's almost very difficult for me to own one on my own. Okay. So in the past, I've, I've owned two Ferrari replicas, which were actually pretty cool cars. I still have in my garage, but they're pretty much uh, project vehicles that are never ending. Um, mm-hmm. But then when it came to the point where I needed to have an extra car that had extra seats, because I have a 350Z as my daily driver. It's a convertible. I love the car. Heavily modified, of course. Um, I needed something with small seats in the back, so I bought a Porsche 911. Mm-hmm. And my passion for Ferrari is dwindling away because <laughs> I'm learning more and more and loving more the reliability, the performance. Um, and it's just very usable, everyday type of car. The Porsche, you're saying? Yeah. Is, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, do you ever do you subscribe to that Porsche magazine? Um, excellence. There's a couple of yes. different ones, but What's I have the high um, end one. Excellence is the. I think that's the one. Um, the Porsche magazine, the the high end one. Yeah. Um, because there is a, a couple. The excellence is the one that I follow the most. Um, excellence is all about Porsches, only Porsches. Um, sure. from new to old and tech stuff and stories and things like that. So. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I keep hearing the beep and it's the alarm in the backdrop. Okay. I thought it was in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, what? Because it's so windy today. <laughs> Sorry about this backdrop. Usually I like to go in my backyard where I got the palm trees or the pool. This I, I was going to do the same, but I said, no, I'll just keep it inside. It'll be well lit. We should be fine. So. Gosh, it's too windy. So let me, uh, I want to <laughs> ask you something about Porsches too. I heard, I'm not sure if this is correct, that yes. Porsche is the most cherished car, uh, the most saved car, the most refurbished car. Uh, are, 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 is any of that true regarding Porsche? Because I guess the durability well, and people love them. They don't just junk them. If people even find them in junkyards, they grab them. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of different Porsche companies that will take some of the older 911s, um, like their Singer 911. Singer's out. They're based out in California. Okay. They'll take a old car strip it completely take off fenders take off bolts take off everything just to leave the skeleton of the vehicle re-weld do everything that they need to do to re-strengthen that chassis yeah and then they will build it to the way that you want and then they throw in a whole new engine and because the older porsches like the old um, air-cooled engines Mm -hmm. used to run in like let's say a 2.7 liter engine or a 3.2 what they've done is they've gone anything when they first started, they were doing 3.8 liter engines, which just gives a little more power and robust. Now they're doing 4.0. And when you talk about power to weight ratio, the okay. performance is fantastic. The balance is good. So you have singer, you have other companies that will do similar Because singer when they're done with their cars, you're talking about a $500,000 uh, refurbish. Wow. But you have practically something that's over but more more than what Porsche 
gave back then and something that's going to kind of perform with more modern braking, modern engine. So it's, um, it'll keep up with most of the cars of today, basically. Gotcha. Like if you watch like those eighties films, I forgot that one with Charlie Sheen, like those vintage Porsche. Oh, like, no man's land. Yeah. No man's <laughs> land. Everyone. I love that yeah. one for its time. Right. And I think a lot of yes. people grew up in the eighties wanting a Porsche because of that movie and amongst other reasons. Right. Yes. My father used to yes. have a Bricklin. I don't know if you remember that car. Cause my yes. father loves collecting cars, but doors open out. Yeah, exactly. It's yes. kind of like a DeLorean, but it's fine. Yeah. But the um, correct. I'm a, I'm a car guy, so I know them all basically. Yeah, we went to test a Porsche back in the early '80s, maybe. And my father goes, "Get ready! It's going to be like somebody punches you in the back because the force and the torque, especially back in those days." Yeah. And we, you'd see, Definitely. you'd see sometimes in the '80s too. We'd go to like Daytona Spring Breaks, and some guys would pull up at a Porsche and a Corvette or whatever. The Porsche would dust. Yes. And I had a Grand National, and that would dust me. I mean, it was just like sitting yes. still, those cars. Yeah. Are those yeah, old, ridiculous. Yeah, those old cars now, uh, those old mm -hmm. Porsches, right? Those are still extremely valuable. And they're refurbishing, I, I mean, besides California in certain areas, like, is that they're refurbishing those a lot still, correct? Yeah, yeah. Most of those cars are kept well because, you know, the owners tend to love them. When you love your car, you take good care of it. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is, um, the the, tur the Porsche you're referring to is a turbo Porsche. Yeah. When it kicks you in, because the older Porsches, um, when you have a turbo Porsche, it's um, they used to call them the Widowmaker, because mm -hmm. when your turbo spool in, it just knocks you. It just basically torque the torque. Just uh, most people tend to lose control because they didn't know how to control that type of uh, sure. initial power that just kicks in, and. Um, a lot of people crashed, lost their lives, and things like that. So, like yeah. that car was, you know, called the widow, the widow maker. That's um, crazy. You know, back then they didn't have traction control and things like that. The things right. that really helped, like the GTR today's. Yeah, those cars are the easiest cars to drive because the car, the computer does everything and controls everything for you. So it, it'll make a beginner, a novice driver, drive like a track star. So, I learned how to drive stick on a Porsche. Yeah. That's Man, because there were back in the eighties when I was parking cars in the mid eighties, there weren't, mm -hmm. there weren't, I mean, there were either crappy cars that had stick shift that you're, you know what I mean? Outdated right. or they were extreme. So my buddy taught me how to drive stick uh, on a Porsche. And ever nice. since I learned on a Porsche, that power, I got used to, you know, when you learn with that power oh, yeah. uh, and then you go to something oh, yeah. else, it's so ridiculous. But um, even I mean, when, you really drove, when you drove automatics, those were powerful. I mean, those were unbelievable because those were, I mean, not many people in the 80s and even the 90s. I mean, now you see, in my opinion, a lot more Ferraris. But back then, you seen them, and where I was from, Chicago, and even Florida, you saw a lot more Porsche, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot yes. more. So, um, yeah. I mean, of course, there were Ferraris, but that was a very limited amount of people, I think. Exclusive. It yeah. was an exclusive, exclusive type right? of car. You know, you'd have to... Yeah, they don't just sell it to anybody. Now, everything's changed, and they will sell it to almost anybody, and... Um, I think if you want one of the more modern Ferraris, there's a long waiting list because everyone orders theirs before they even come out with the new model. So if, if I hit the lotto, let's say I hit the mother load and I went to the Ferrari dealership to get a new car, who are you, sir? We don't know who you are. Mm. I don't care who, you know, billions and no. Right. So I have to buy one of their initial base vehicles first to qualify to get the next model, the next year. Yeah. So it's a little different how they do their business. Wow. That's crazy. The, um, what was I going to ask you? It just jumped out of my head. Oh, the, now the value compared to, you know, you hear Lamborghinis all the time and how much they, mm -hmm. cause I even have relatives that have some Lamborghinis and they claim they lose a lot of value. The insurance is astronomical on them. Obviously the maintenance on these cars is astronomical. I'm sure it falls in line mm -hmm. with the Ferrari probably the Porsche as well. Yeah. Uh, much. Right. When it comes though to, I heard out of Lamborghini or Porsche that Ferraris hold their value the best out of a lot of high end cars. That, I mean, I, I, there's exclusive ones of course that are always going to hold their value, mm -hmm. but say generally I went to buy a Porsche Ferrari or Lamborghini uh, 2020, what's going to lose the most value you think, or what's going to hold the best value? Out of Porsche, Lamborghini, and Ferrari? Yeah. 
Ferrari will always hold its value because of how they've changed their business, the, you know, how they sell their vehicles. Um, they're exclusive. Um, there's a couple of models that they make a lot of, so it makes it easier to come across. Mileage has a lot to do with it. Sure. Um, if you, most people buy them before, back in the days, um, you buy a Testarossa. Mm-hmm. Men, a, any type of main, maintenance on that vehicle is engine out. So you have to put the car in a lift, drop the engine out to do any type of maintenance on it. Oh, so man. it was, you're talking about five to seven to $8,000, you know, general, simple maintenance and such. Whereas um, Lambo, you really didn't have to do any engine out type of stuff. Um, but again, it depends on what model. So right. other Ferraris like the 348, the 355, you had to do engine out. And those were not as expensive. You could probably find a good 355 right now. That's in the 90s. That's a Ferrari from the 90s. Yeah. You know, something in the $80,000, $70,000 range. But you, your maintenance is five to seven grand engine out. The 360 Modena, which came out in 2000, um, those were the first that they had a panel in the back of the seats hmm. that you could remove that panel and have access to your timing belts to change, which, of course, did not require engine out maintenance, which mm-hmm. changed the pricing and made it a little more affordable. And the performance was always a little better, too. So, again, it's, it's so many different variations. And, you know, the main thing is mileage and such. Lamborghinis on the intro, um, different buyers for the Lamborghinis now um, than the Ferrari buyers. Ferrari buyers tend to be a little different and such. Sure. Um, the Lambo guys tend to, um, the value of Lambos still hold well, but they're still, like, you know, they're supercars, you know? Yeah. So they're always going to cost money. You know, you're going to pay a hundred grand. If you look at a Gallardo, that's the um, V10, the first V10 that Lambo came out with, rear-mounted. Rear those were considered possibly one of the most reliable cars. And the same mm. thing with the new Huracans. The Huracans now, again, when it comes to reliability, that's the ones to get. Um, but you can get a, 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 you know, good mileage, you know, something in the 50, 60,000 mile Lamborghini um, Gallardo, maybe in the 60, 70, 80,000 even. Mm-hmm. You know, with some cause, something that's been driven, something that's been loved, you know, garage queens tend to, you know, people that tend to keep their cars in the garage and they say, well, in a couple of years, I'm going to sell it, but I'm not going to put miles on it before they sell it. They have to put money into it to mm-hmm. refurbish it because mm-hmm. of dry rod and things like that. So it ends up costing them 10 to 15 to 20,000 just to get it ready to sell just because they did not drive that car. You know, same thing, same thing with the older car. So if you want to buy a car, you know, I, in my opinion, buy something that's been driven. Of course. Um, okay. Not abused. You want to get good records, service records, of course. Sure. You want to do a PD, uh, pre-purchase inspection, PPI. Mm. That's when you take it to a specialist and they will basically let you know how everything is running on the vehicle to make mm. sure that you don't have to buy it and then dish out money out of pocket to fix things that you weren't ready for, you know? So... But yeah. to hold their value, I'd have to say Ferrari. The the ones that basically that are affordable supercars are Porsches, you know. So and there's a yeah. controversy. People say that they're sports cars, not supercars. But um, I always get preferable parking when I go to the valet. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I love it. Yeah, and I think, uh, too, when we go to these car shows like Festival of Speed and all those shows, uh, when you think sometimes of a Ferrari, you're going to think about, you know, Miami Vice with that white Testarossa. You still see that or Magnum PI, those Ferrari. Those still hold pretty well value, right? Well, there was a time back in um, 2000-something, early 2000s, the Testarossa, because of the maintenance cost. Yeah. Um. People, they, the value was going down. I mean, I, I've heard of Testarossa's going for $35,000. Holy shit. Um, yeah, really ridiculous. And, you know, people just didn't want to pay the maintenance costs. They drove them, and when things start to break, it costs a lot of money. V12 mm-hmm. will break your bank, basically. Um, <laughs> then market changed, and Testarossa's were going for over 150000 170000 you know, right now it's kind of bottomed out to about a hundred so or so thousand dollars, I think, from the last that I've seen. Um, I knew someone selling his Testarossa for, I think he was asking 
80 grand for it. Hmm. Um, and his car's in pristine condition. I mean, he takes care. He's a local guy too, but now he tends to drive it a little bit more than let it sit. So, which is good. So, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Cause I live in the, uh, Metro West Windermere area. So we see mm-hmm. a lot of different cars, you know, obviously sure. from Audis to Ferraris to Lambos to everything in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I mm-hmm. eat the, uh, who's the baseball player? How Ken Griffey Jr. Cruising around. Um, mm-hmm. do you on OBT and, um, colonial drive, there's that dealership. It's exclusive. My buddy's friend. I forgot what the name of that is. Anyways, from what I I'll understand, that's all right. I can't remember it either. The, you know, a lot of these wealthy guys, let's face it, they get these cars and they get bored with them, right? They claim like after six months to a year, right? And they kind of just, mm-hmm. you know, even professional athletes or wealthy people, it's kind of become something. Right. They don't even care if they lose value. They kind of interchange their cars, right? Sometimes a little bit. For their image, basically. Yeah, they, they change them out and things like that. It's interesting because... You know, I could see getting bored with, you know, no matter what car I've gotten, and I've had some really nice cars as well, I'm not going to lie. It does become yeah. where after a certain amount of time, it's just a, a car, right? It's almost like you want to experiment with another car to a certain, like, yes. like you got to commit. Like when you commit to a car, a lot of yes. people, we're so used to four to six years. But when you start buying yes. sports cars, it's almost addictive, you know, and I've had, it, it, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's a problem because, um, I'm a different type of sports car kind of guy. I buy things that I like mm-hmm. and I have no intentions of letting them go. Cause I'm like a car hoarder. If you want to say that I'll mm-hmm. keep it. And then, um, when I want something new, I'll get something else to add to the collection. Basically that's, that's usually the goal. Um, but when it comes to some people, I know guys at their cars as long as I've known them mm-hmm. and they just either get others and they don't, it's just that sometimes you get a little bored of the performance and you want more. So that's how some people do it. I've basically modified my Porsche. So this way I don't, you know, I'm not a super wealthy guy or anything like that. I'm just a regular schmo that, you know, placed myself and did some things and I ended up getting a Porsche 911 and I absolutely love it. So I've modified a couple of things on my car to basically give me that fresh new feeling all over again, you know? Yeah. Do you think it's, better to invest like say you're the average joe again out there and as you know a lot of times you can even buy a corvette or you could buy even a mercedes or whatever the case may be and Mm -hmm. you know they depreciate right let's call it for what it is a lot of those cars especially if you're paying interest on them car payments whatever do you think it'd be better for people even though it's harder to get a loan but getting kind of a vintage car or a car that actually is appreciating compared to depreciating would it be you think a better investment to do that? But I know again the maintenance when it kind when it comes to that sometimes is a pain in the ass too though. But uh, my point being is a lot of people end up upside down in a lot of cars as you know, even sports cars. And I'm not talking Lambos yes. or Ferraris. Yes. I'm just talking mid level sports cars you buy for fifty, sixty, seventy, even eighty, whatever. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, in five years it's worth mm-hmm. twenty grand, right? And you still owe forty or whatever Absolutely. the amount. You think it'd be better yeah. for somebody to go buy? Yeah. Would you think it'd be a better in- investment for people now to start buying older cars and that can appreciate? So say a Grand National that I used to own, that seems to be constantly gaining some mm-hmm. traction every year. Same with maybe certain. No, it's gaining. Exactly. Right. I'm just using that for an example. Do you think it'd be better for people to start investing in mm-hmm. old cars instead of always buying new and getting you know, hit with a car that depreciates? Absolutely. I mean, it depends again on, on the person and what they're trying to do. Um, for me, um, if you're buying a car that, like they say, the whole, the old antage is you drive off the lot, you lose five grand instantly. Yeah. Um, that has nothing to do with the depreciation of a car because you just paid a boatload of money for the car. Mm-hmm. It has to do, I think with the insurance, because if you crash a car, the insurance will pay a certain amount. They don't want to pay the full amount. So sure. that's become what the car depreciated value is basically. Mm-hmm. So, for me, I, 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 you know, people that just want the latest and the greatest will pay full pop. They're wealthy. If they know they're going to lose some money, it's no big deal. Like I'm going to use Tesla as an example. Tesla came out with the P100s basically. And if you get with the D, then you have that super ludicrous mode in there and everything. Those cars were selling for $100,000, $120,000 brand new. Mm-hmm. Fastest electric car around, which is great. 
you can get them used right now for 35,000. And mm. right now that car is what, three to four to five years old. So it's not like, uh, uh, you know, to depreciate that far down, you're still making payments, you know, if you, if you went to sure. finance it. So my thing is if you're that, that guy that really wants that car, by use at 40, 50 grand, then you don't get depreciation hit that much and you're sure. still getting the enjoyment of the vehicle and all in reliability still because it's still fairly new opposed to getting an older vintage car. If you want to get an older vintage car, you know, my, my Porsche is a 2006 and mm. um, sticker price on the car was uh, 110,000 because it's a convertible and it's the leather, it has all the nice options in there. Um, yeah. You know, you could find a car like that now. I bought my car five years ago, but you buy, you could find a car like that now, an 06 with some miles on it in the 30s, in the 40s, you know? So right. again, and you drive anywhere, you, you're driving a Porsche. They don't look at the year, you know? You're, you're yeah. a Porsche owner, you're a Porsche owner. That's how the Porsche community works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you think now, because I've been to auctions and stuff, and there's always the thing that comes up, are you better off buying it at auction at a dealership? And obviously when you buy it at an auction, you have to pay for everything in, in all, you know, total. It's not like you can finance. I mean, you could get a loan before that and just, but you have to pay for it outright when you get to the auction, when you're bidding it on it. Right. Do you think right now auction purchase is a little different because when you're buying from an auction, um, you really sometimes don't really know what you're getting. Sure. I know they have specific auctions like Mannheim and um, Barrett Jackson where they're a little more exclusive and you're, mm -hmm. you know, you have history on the car, then you're going to pay basically top dollar, even though it's yeah. just at an auction, you know, you have a couple of people that you're going to be bid against and especially limited number cars and, and, and vintage cars. You're going to, you're going to pay some money for those things. I was just at that. I didn't go to the show, but it was going on while I was in Scottsdale. Last time I flew in that show. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is everything so expensive? Like rental cars. They didn't have anything available. They wanted 250 a day. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? The Barrett Jackson, the Barrett -Jackson yeah. show, the one on TV. Yeah. yeah, those are exclusive auctions. How about, I'm talking maybe what I should have said is more kind of local, like Orlando has a huge auction, as you know, or, you know, auctions sure. all over the, the country. The Ocoee auction. Ocoee, yeah. Definitely. Like, yes. when you go there, would you be better off buying a sports car, you think, there? And I, mean, I get that you don't know what you're buying, but a lot of times there mm -hmm. are some incredible deals when it comes to sports cars, mm -hmm. and I, all For types sure. of cars. But compared mm -hmm. to going to a dealership, what do you think about that? Like, what would you, if... Well, the, the benefit of when you go to a dealership, let's say you go to like my dealership. I have a, it's a full fledged Hyundai dealership. Mm -hmm. We have certified mechanics and, you know, occasionally they do pick up some vehicles at the auction because of, you know, specialty cars they're looking for. All of our cars, when they go through the auction, they do go through an inspection process. We have to look at the chassis, make sure it's not twisted. We'll look at, you know, certain things to make sure that we're comfortable to resell that car mm -hmm. um whereas when you're buying at an auction if you don't know what you're looking for and you yeah. just you know you, i think you have the opportunity to hear the engine and open the hood if you don't know what you're looking for you really don't know what you're getting right. in addition to that you have no service records on some of these cars some people keep them in the glove box but some people don't and they just you know my car serviced well but um i keep all my stuff in the in the pockets but aside from that, when they take a car from an auction, they'll clean everything out and then just sell the car with no papers or anything, you know, mm -hmm. at some auctions because they have to take everyone's, um, your personal information out of the vehicle so they don't want to have your names or anything like that. Right. So it's the cash 22. You'll get a good deal if you're hands on with your vehicle and you, you feel comfortable enough to buy a car and, and, and you buy it low enough to protect yourself on the repairs that you're going to have to do and to update. You want to change your brakes. You want to change your oil. You want to maybe even change your spark plugs. So you know that it's done now and not, you know, happen to drive it. And then it's of course things start to fail on you because you didn't do your due diligence. So you didn't change them out when you should have. So that's, that's uh, auctions are okay to buy, but it really is. Uh, you just got to be careful. Yeah. And I heard a lot of those cars at the auction. I'm not sure. Not all of them, but a lot of them I heard have uh, the frames are damaged and they don't kind of talk about that or they were obviously in accidents or re, mm -hmm. you know, reconstructed. Because even, I remember when I got my Grand National, I had a cracked frame and I never was even informed of that. I guess somebody got in a real bad accident, but we realized right. my glass, went my, the, my front windshield, it started to split and then we took it in, they replaced the front windshield, but then my 
dad's buddy was a mechanical is they have to take this in because I guess when they re-welded it, they didn't weld it correctly. It wasn't right, but they never even informed us or informed us no. of the damage. And I think is that something that's kind of common with a lot of sports cars? You think that there is damage um, kind of hide that when purchased? Well, most people that buy sports cars, they buy them to drive them and drive them hard. That's sure. what they're going to do. Of course. Um, some people do track their cars and they take them on tracks. And, you know, I belong to Porsche Club of America, the PCA. Mm -hmm. And one thing they do is they have their days that they, you know, on the weekends that they do. Because Porsche, to me, as far as I've seen, is one of the most active car clubs out of all the car clubs. You can have Ferrari, Lambo, Maserati. Ferrari guys brag about how low their miles are. Porsche guys brag about how much how many miles they have on their car because wow. they drive their car. Yeah, it's incredible. Right. So the thing that they'll track their cars. And sometimes my biggest fear about tracking a car is every lap you do, you say, man, I can go a little faster. I can go a little faster. You want to beat your time. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you're sliding into a wall. <laughs> that is my biggest fear. Sure. So you slam into a wall and then you fix it and it's fixed. It's fine. But then those guys will say, hey, you know, no big deal. I'll fix it, drive a little more, and then I'll sell it, and I'll get another one. No big deal. So sometimes you have to make sure you know the history of that car to see if you're getting something that's crashed. Now, if you're on a – I have a buddy of mine looking for a 911 right now, too. Mm -hmm. He has a budget. Um, so sometimes with that budget, you're okay with getting something with higher miles. Sometimes you say, well, if I get this, this is going to be a keeper for me as well. Maybe you're okay with buying a car that had a little accident history. Mm -hmm. But again, those are things that you have to consider because now when you go to resell that car, the car is going to have higher miles. The car is going to have that still that accident history. And then that next buyer may have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. may not want to pay what you're asking. Right. You know the car is still, still a good car. Um, for me, every car is a good car. If, you, if, it's not, if you're driving on snow and you don't see four tire patches, you're good. If you see the two because everything's lined up and it was done well, done professionally, then you, you should be fine. Yeah, when Porsche went, what's it, a Cheyenne? Is that what they call that? Bigger car. Oh, the Cayenne. Cayenne. The Cayenne, the SUV, yes. I screw everything up. The, well, you know, first yeah, they, had, no, no, you're fine. they first had the Porsche, and it was a little bigger, right? The, the longer one more to Cayenne. That's the Panamera. Oh, Panamera. The Panamera is the four-door. The four door, yes. And the Cayenne, which, yeah, and that's the SUV, which kind of saved Porsche because um, people, you know, nowadays you see more SUVs. Every car company has an SUV. Absolutely yeah, because my friends have those. Else. Yeah, they love those. Yeah. They wanted yeah. the car. Yeah. I don't. They first were thinking of getting the car, but then once you came out the mm -hmm. SUV, they jumped on that. And I was going to ask you, wasn't that a big? Because that seems like a very popular car, obviously, right now. But they're all over the place, and then yeah. they've even come out with the McCann, which is a slightly smaller SUV. Mm -hmm. um, with they say you get a McCann Turbo S, it's going to drive like a 911 even though it's an SUV. So right. now a car like that, if you get one pre-owned, you'll spend less money on it, but the performance is all there and you will never regret that car. If you're the SUV family, you know, you put your kids sure. in the back. So that's, that's definitely something that, you know, can work. Um, but the Panamera also is another big savior to Porsche. In the beginning when they first came out, I think they came out in... 09 or 08 don't don't quote me on that but right the back was the big controversy because the back looked almost like an egg and yeah i, don't I think didn't a lot like of, it i don't think a lot of people like the look of that yeah but, you know the, the new the new one is fantastic now because yeah. it literally looks like a 911 cut in half stretched with four doors and that that the lines are beautiful and all that good stuff but nowadays the, the, i think that look of the old egg back on the old pan the original panameras mm -hmm. has really grown on me and i actually can appreciate them now a little more than i did when they first came out yeah i just saw that rolls royce suv yeah, I yeah think the, i forgot what it's, it's called it's like an extended version it's a big one though it's a big huge. suv it's a beast i saw it in window yeah. holy shit oh yeah goddamn huge tank. huge I have a friend of mine who just bought a um, a Rolls. He bought the two door Rolls, and 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 that's really nice also because that's like the suicide doors and all that. Mm -hmm. But I went to see the um the 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 Rolls Royce because Rolls Royce is already a big car in itself. Oh yeah. Um. So the SUV just is humongous, but it's really not not my cup of tea because I'm not an SUV luxury type guy. I like mm. performance, 
and that's what what moves me basically do those cars hold their value like you know each one of those Porsche styles you're mentioning do those each hold their value equally kind of to a certain point or is kind of one that like you know SUV decline they, quicker they do or oh do they do they hold their value a little bit yeah, I don't I mean, think a lot they, of people they, even know they all hold their value because it's Porsche but you know what in your definition is holding your value sure because you know you could buy a Porsche Panamera 80 grand brand new base model almost you know then you you add some turbos and things like that you're into almost 200 grand basically for a nice turbo with the electric engine and all that combined and all so but then when you get it pre-owned i've heard that an early model turbo s black on black um is a guy that i follow on um, youtube hoovy's garage he bought one for six grand at an auction a turbo wow timing's yeah. everything but right? now he's the kind of guy that timing is everything you know maybe it was a rainy day nobody came out that day no sure. one came for it he got it, you know, so, but it had some little slight issues, but after he fixed it, it was a great car that he resold it. That's what he does for his channel. He buys cars that are, um, what he called hoopties and then, uh, hoopty exotic cars basically. And he fixes them up and sells them, but he bought that for six grand. And I was like, wow, I, <laughs> even I can get that. <laughs> It's kind of funny because my buddy owns one of the largest towing, Johnson's Towing in all of Orlando, Junior Johnson. And he used to pick up cars where people yes. like, say, drug dealers or whoever the hell, uh, felons, whatever. But a lot yes. of them pay for their cars uh, cash. Yes. And then they get arrested. They get put in the joint. And then he tows it. And then if no one claims it, I'm pretty sure after a certain amount of time, he puts a lien on it. Then after a certain amount of time, if he Come wants, he, he owns it or he can send mm -hmm. it to the auction. And whatever yes. they get, he gets cash for it, yes. or he keeps them and flips them. And sometimes I would think maybe at that auction, somebody yeah. may have had that car. They don't. It, it's nothing to them or whatever. They just take whatever they could get for that car. I'm just wondering if that was that's right. a kind of weird thing with uh, oh, know, yeah. towing companies, which is kind of amazing in itself. All of a sudden, you pick up these cars and no one claims them. They go to jail or go to another country. They flee, especially places in Florida. Happens all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now, I think in whether I think it's Dubai or, um, oh, I can't remember, but I think it's Dubai or one of these places. People have exotic cars and they abandon them in the streets. I heard of that too. Yeah, and you can go around. You'll see the, the the dust all over the place. And these are cars that they just decided, you know what? I don't want it no more. Take his plates, walk away from the vehicle, and I'm like. <laughs> let me find something like that here you know but they're all over the place so i don't know whether that's going to be the next biggest thing where you buy it from there and then you you know take it and ship it here refurbished depending on what the modifications you have to do now to pass emissions in the u.s so wh whether it's worth it, i think it would still be worth it because if you're buying a car that was just abandoned you probably pay a lot less for it but um you know, there's a guy, um, uh, Royalty Exotics. He's in um, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. He has two Bugattis. Okay. So one of his Bugattis, he had removed the panels and put these now exclusive, really crazy panels on it. So he's selling just the panels of his Bugatti. The fenders, the no, without the doors, the fenders, the hood, the rear, the side fenders, all the panels. I think he's asking one hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow. for just the panels. Wow! Just the panels. So when you buy in a car, you got to be careful too. Expense expense on parts. You know, you don't want to go over your budget because then you might as well just find a car that works and you just buy it and that's it. So yeah. Buying a car like that that's been abandoned or crashed, um, people are doing it all the time now, and I think that's the next biggest thing. Is you know. There's a lot of cars that were tracked, that were hit and put to the side, and people are taking them, um, doing everything with them. You know? I'm in Canada a lot, and I heard, I don't know if this is wrong, I may be screwing this up, but in Vancouver, they're one of the most, uh, they purchase the most luxury cars like mm. in the world or something. Like, a, I don't know which specific really? car, but there's so many people in Vancouver buy all different types of high-end cars. And it's amazing. I don't know if you've wow. been there, but if you go there, obviously there's a ton of money there. Uh, you'll see people driving I, all, 
and they got Rolls Royce dealerships. They're not small. They're beasts. Right. And you see all these different dealerships that someone told me. It's a, it's a funny thing in Vancouver. Like they they're like the most expensive cars purchased, but at the same time, it's they show the least amount of money or like for taxes. Like it's a weird like it right. doesn't make any sense what they show they make and what they're purchasing. It's yeah, kind of wall with Canada. Um, that was just something I heard. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but when I am there, no, I mean, there are so many damn luxury cars there. It blows you away. Wow. For kind of, it is. So, uh, let's yeah. jump into you now. Um, what I want, I discussed with you a little earlier is kind of the future of yeah. car dealers. We're not, and when I say this, I don't mean wealthy guys that could buy whatever the car they want and we get, they don't give a shit about the regular. Just smoking. Yeah. Devaluing. I don't, most people like my father used to say, if you can't burn a hundred dollars in front of you, wait, if you burn a hundred dollars in front of you, if it affects you, you don't deserve a sports car. <laughs> like that was his saying. <laughs> like if, if money affects you, you Basically. don't deserve these cars, right? If you're worrying about the car devaluing, Basically. You probably shouldn't yes. have a car. I mean, it was kind of his. You shouldn't story. buy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like dabbling with the stock markets. If you're afraid and you're always watching, it's not yeah. for you then, you know? If yeah. you're worried about the maintenance on a Ferrari, Porsche, whatever, then you probably shouldn't buy it, right? And Don't it, do it. Right? If, you, if, if the tires, for instance, or if an oil change, the price of that aggravates you, again, you don't deserve the car. Just say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but let's just say forget that shit. We get that. Um. I'm talking about just regular people now buying cars, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the Corona situation. Um, I don't mm -hmm. want to get in depth with Corona. What are you going through at the dealership a little bit, if you could tell me? Has it taken a major hit? What do you think the future of buying cars is going to be like? Credit scores look a little different because everyone's losing their jobs. You know, you're probably seeing some. Yeah. How's that going? It's, it, it's funny because um, our dealership, in the car business, it's, um, everything's always okay. Don't worry, it'll get better. Don't worry, don't worry, it'll get better. We understand that we have to be motivated, and, and, and I understand the mentality. Um, but when you look at the decline in the business, because in my store, um, I work for a Hyundai dealership in Claremont. It's a three-year-old dealership, so it's brand new, basically. It's mint. Um, we've Yes, it it's really mint. is. When you and, even drive um, past that, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. You need to stop by, though. I know. <laughs> it's I see fantastic. It. it doesn't look yeah. like a regular Hyundai dealership. You know what I mean? It looks no, no, no. Like a no, like, yeah, no nonsense. Out of nine hundred and ninety-three dealerships nationwide, Hyundai Corporation in Korea said our dealership was by far the best platform that they've ever seen. So they're they've raised the bar for all the other Hyundai stores, and they said you've got to kind of emulate what these guys are doing because they've sure. really made it right. So our store out of the three years, we're getting just new business. We don't have so much return business of people saying my car's three year lease is over or four year. This year is where we're going to start to see that. But we were at one point 23 in the nation mm -hmm. in car sales Okay, out of 900 a night. That's an awesome feat for a new store. Sure. And that's just with new business. Like I said, not return business. So when all this broke out, we see a decline, but we're not the only one that's been hit. Everybody's been hit. Everything is slow, but we do get an influx of customers that come in. Like for instance, this weekend, we were standing room only. I mean, we had people in the store, they were okay. buying cars. It couldn't, I couldn't believe it. You know, yeah, it is, it's, I'd rather be home with my girls safe, but you know, we're, we're considered essential. So we had to be there and I'm okay with it when things are happening. When nothing is happening, that's when you start to get a little bothered by it. But we're constantly so every we're selling ten to and up per day or so. So we're still selling a lot of cars. Are people buying them online too more because of this Corona situation too, or the, you know, is yes. that what they're doing as well? Two things: Corona and Carvana. <laughs> um, so Carvana has a thing where when you buy a car, this is prior to any of this even happening, right. Carvana would deliver. And then, you know, they put the car on a flatbed, deliver, you do the paperwork. People tend to like that because yeah. now they're not at the dealership. Like you said, some people rather go to the dentist and get their tooth extracted I would. instead of coming to a dealership, you know, yeah. and it's true. But I try to make it pleasant because I think it's, I'm a car guy and I want you to have fun in the process. So I have a lot of fun with my clients as, sure. we, as we go forward with everything. But now with masks, 
sanitizing and all of that stuff, people don't want to come to the dealership. So mm -hmm. our dealership is accommodated. And we said part of our thing, if you look at our website, we'll deliver the car to you. We'll bring it to you. We'll first make sure that you qualify. First, make sure that your credit is right. First, we get your approval. Then we'll drop it off and we'll, we'll deliver it. Mask, gloves in hand. So mm -hmm. this way you're safe and you feel comfortable. Yeah. Are you working out deals with that, uh, with people? Cause you know, for instance, say somebody wants a new car and you know, they were laid off or furloughed. Are you, do you have some wiggle room there now? Like credit scores too, you know, people's credit um, scores are going to take a hit to a certain degree where yeah, right, you, right now, just like it's business as usual because okay. your credit still has to be good to buy a car. You know, sure. it's just, uh, it's the banks that want it, not us. We want to sell a car, so we don't care. Right. But the banks, before they take the risk of sending the money to pay for that car, then you have to pay them back. They just want to make sure that you're not a flight risk, basically. So, you know, the credit has to be good. Um, our Hyundai, what they're doing is 120 days before your first payment. Mm. But you do have to qualify for that. You know, you have to make sure your credit is, is good. Because, you know, despite people, um, hmm. what's the word, um, not being able to work, some people still have money in the bank, you know, some people could still say I could support myself. If you're buying a car it's because you're comfortable that you can afford it even in this time. So they're there. They, they have to still qualify, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've had some people with some challenge credit. Sure. Want to buy a car at 0%. They want to buy a car and not pay for 120 days. Cause I'll find a job by then. It just doesn't work that way. Right. 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 Yeah. Obviously that doesn't work at all. What is yeah. Hyundai's big angle? My dad's a Hyundai guy, I think. Don't you offer, is it a, I don't want to screw this up, um, 100,000 miles, uh, uh, maintenance-wise, what is the whole Power train. What is yeah. that whole thing? I'm trying so, to remember. I haven't, I didn't purchase get, one, but he's discussed these things. Get, get, get your paper and pencil out because it's a lot. <laughs> so most car companies will give the normal three-year, 36,000 mile on the powertrain warranty. No, yes. on the end, on bumper to bumper. And then the five-year, 60 powertrain. And then this, that's it. Yeah. Hyundai, the, by far the best warranty in the car industry. Basically. That's what they're known for. Right? That's what I'm talking about. That's what about. they're known for. That's the 100,000. Five right? years. Yeah, well, it's five years, 60. Bumper to bumper, what we would call the new car warranty. That's anything okay. mechanical, electrical. Then you get the 10-year, 100,000 mile on your powertrain, engine, transmission, anything mm -hmm. that touches oil, basically. Then you get five years unlimited mileage on roadside assistance anywhere mm -hmm. in the United States. They'll tow you, bring you to the closest Hyundai dealership. They drop you off. That part is not going to be there for two days. So now you have road interruption because you're sitting there. It has to be more than 150 miles away from your home. So Hyundai will pay for road interruption warranty as well. So mm. they'll pay for your hotel. They'll pay for your food up to $500 wow. on that. Yeah. So nice. if you're traveling across the, you know, to the Midwest and halfway, car breaks down, they're covering your hotel, your food. You know, I don't even remember when I had a need. caddy and a link in them offering that. I don't no, remember them no, ever. Hyundai I remember is, them. They'll bring you a caddy. Like when I had a caddy, they yes. would bring you another caddy and I would get in and you could mm -hmm. that caddy and then they deal with it. But I don't ever remember anybody offering what you're offering. Oh, yeah. And then there's seven years for perforation, which is rust. Um, if you scratch your paint and it rusts, that's on you. But if you're start to develop rust or bubbling underneath your paint. Mm -hmm. That means it's something that's compromised there. They're covering it for seven years, unlimited mileage. So that's then as of February 1st of 2020, which just passed, this is something new with Hyundai, any new Hyundai's purchase after February 1st, they're going to do three years, 36,000 miles, oil changes and tire rotations. That's whack. It's ridiculous. It's that's ridiculous. Great. So What's Hyundai is killing it right now yeah and your car that genesis because that car is a beast right because i remember when i bought the, yeah. the original 2004 chrysler hemi 300 right that was like yes. the car of the year and that was everyone went crazy for it and in my opinion yes. it seems like in in this day and age like the genesis took that kind of spot right because it's so beautiful Ooh. it almost looks yeah you know, like, a, I don't know, is it a Bentley? Is it a Rolls? I it has its own look, but it looks high it's, end, yeah, body, it look. whatever it, it is. That, it, reeks. It, it more than looks high wow. end. It is high end. That yeah, car right. is amazing. Um, 
my thing is in a couple of years, I'm going to get a G70 with the 3.3 twin turbo, 3.3 liter V6 twin turbo. That car right now outperforms my, my 911. Mm. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. My car is faster, but mm. the zero to 60, the performance on that car is ridiculous. And it's um, technologically advanced with all of the safety features that's required nowadays, automatic stopping, lane, you know, departure warning, everything. intelligent cruise control, everything, everything, everything. Um, so the entry-level vehicle is the G70. The mid-range is the new G80 that's coming out. They're re-changing the body. If you want to look it up, look up 2021 G80. Okay. Blow your way. Mm. Um, and then the flagship vehicle, which is more of the Highline Bentley type competitor, would be the G90. Hmm. And then this year, they're finally coming out with their own SUV, which is the GV80, followed by the GV70. So the GV80 is based on the G80 platform, which is a hmm. larger SUV. Um, and then, of course, the GV70 is going to be based on the G70 platform. Uh, and they're coming out with two new engines for those cars, the 2.5 liter turbo instead of the 2.0, right. they're changing it. And then now they're coming out with the 3.5 liter twin turbo opposed to the 3.3 twin turbo. And then they're also going to have the V8 engine as well. So. It's unbelievable. My buddy Kyle, who's obsessed with cars, he works for a dealership as well. Uh, maybe the yeah. in parts, he's all over the after in all he does is talk about cars sells cars throughout his entire he's like if there's ever a car to buy it's the genesis uh the one that oh, has that's he loaded he's like don't short yourself go with the black don't top. don't the, you yeah, know yeah. I mean, all power he goes up display yeah you so want like, it, you want it all. looks like a cockpit in yeah play. <laughs> anyways that's yeah that's his thing man he's like and he also thinks for the value uh it holds value and obviously like you're saying uh the service is unbelievable uh, he loves yes. those cars. So, yeah, mm -hmm. unbelievable. That's your gig. That is your gig. Yeah, right over there. Yeah, I got to get over yeah. there. That I, thing looks unbelievable. That dealership. Anytime we'll go for a test drive. You will. You will be wowed, especially by the G70. The G80 is great, but that's more of a bigger luxury car. I know you like bigger cars. You like to feel, you know, that you know, yeah, that the roominess. But if you want a tight feeling car that's made for the back roads and. You know, that car is Nürburgring tra 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 tested, basically, mm -hmm. for the G70. And it's um, it's phenomenal performance on that vehicle. Yeah, for sure. Have you heard, I'm going to wrap it up soon, because I like to keep these in an hour, mm -hmm. and I want to have you as a reoccurring guest. Yeah. Have you heard anything about any, any shows coming up? Like, obviously, they're all closed because of Corona right now. Are you hearing anything yeah. as far as even, um, you know, car shows, now, I don't mean the ones me and you go to, the kind of the local ones. I'm talking like uh, the mm -hmm. ones that are at the convention center, the McCormick Place in Chicago, the big, big car shows where they're getting ready to release the 2021s and all that. How is that? Um, are they canceling those? And is that going to really have a huge impact on the public? You're going to only see them online. I don't mean to throw all those questions. Huge. Yeah, right. I mean, because no, I got answers those, to everything. Yeah, those shows are coming up, and I go to those some of those shows along yeah. with boat shows. But if you, the public doesn't get to yeah. see them either online or go personally because it has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. on people, how's mm -hmm. that? Uh, so the thing is, the Geneva Car Show is probably one of the biggest car shows of the year, okay. and that's where they introduce a lot of the 2021 models of everything from Ferrari to, uh, down to. Volkswagen. I mean, they show everything basically. So of course, due to Corona, they were just getting ready. I mean, they were literally loading the arenas with the cars yeah. and then everything had to be canceled. So they had to take the cars back. <sighs> so what they've done to kind of um, still, they still want to show their cars out because that's how they market it. And then they get them to ready for the year Sure, to be sold. Um, they've gotten in touch with some prominent YouTube people with the, the highest subscribers um and basically said hey i want you to review our car so even before that they before they got rid of the uh, uh removed them from their location at geneva mm -hmm. they would invite those people over while they had the backing and all of that staging set up that they spent thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up yeah the youtubers would use that so one of them one of the popular youtube guys was shmi he got to talk and about a couple of different cars because he's very um exact he's very um very um 
detail oriented, precise with specific his information. Yeah. yeah, very detail oriented with his information, and um, he's one of the, the the better guys. He's been doing it for ten years, so they've invited him. They invited a couple of you know, uh, what is it, the Mister J W W. They had him out there. They had a couple mm. of like I said, a lot of guys where they just sat review the cars. They didn't get to drive them because they were indoors, but they got to open them, sit them, just talk about the vehicles. So another guy that I follow also, he was given, they, they bought the car to him, to his house. So mm. now he was able to drive on the back roads, you know, isolated, you know, with their, you know, distancing and all that stuff. But he was in the car. He was able to drive. He's in from, he's from California. Mm. So he recently got to review some of the cars. So people are looking at the cars online because they cannot really go to the locations and stuff like that. So I was actually thinking on the flip side, if you couldn't go to these shows, the convention shows mm -hmm. uh, and those, it would actually help the dealerships because now a lot of people, I think, go to those car shows, um, but mm -hmm. wouldn't go to the dealership to buy them or whatever, or see them, where in your case, maybe they can't go yes. to the conventions. They can, now, if you want to see the new Genesis, you can't go to a show like that. You've got to go to the dealership to see it. Right, so, yeah. Uh, which I think, yeah. I thought maybe so, help different dealerships as far as volume now, because like I said, the only, a lot of times, a lot of us depend on saying, hey, even if it's Miami or wherever, let's go to the big show and we'll see every damn car. Mm -hmm. And then the ones we may or may not like, yes. or maybe never even go to a dealership. But now it's kind of a little yes. cool where you got to go to the dealership yeah. to see it. So you got to go to the dealership. And, and, but the thing is that that's changing because there's so much information online that you can go yeah. to YouTube, you do reviews. Of course. You can knock out the cars that you don't want. When you come to the dealership is specifically to get the feel of the vehicle and just drive it. Cause you basically pretty much narrowed it down. They say one, you, people now visit 1.2 dealerships. I don't know where they get the 0.2 from, but it's 1.2 dealerships to make their final decisions because they've done all their research online. Absolutely. So we, you know, yeah, and and it makes it just easier because they already know what they want. So now what that does is, is it's forced the salesperson to be a lot more um, knowledgeable about their car because that guy's going to come in and have questions that online he couldn't get answers to sure so he's going to smell it when you start to bs and you don't know they're going to walk and that's going to affect your deal that's going to affect the store you have to know what you're talking about especially with a product like genesis where the competitors are bmw mercedes infinity you know jaguar um sure. range rover when you're looking at the suvs basically so if you've got that guy that that's looking for that type of car He's going to know his stuff. Now you got to wow him for him to say, I'm going to buy a Genesis. Yeah. So um, before people go to the car shows, like you're saying, they touch the car, they feel it because they had no intentions of looking at a Genesis. Then they look and they say, what is this? Then they go look at the car, sit the car. Then they were like, well, I'm going to come in and drive it. Sure. So the car shows really help the dealerships, oh, yeah. um, you know, with their promotions. And again, when you have a new product, like the new GV 80, that's coming out, the new SUV, um, no one's really going to get to sit in it now. So now they kind of have to come to the dealership if they have that interest on that vehicle. If they don't know about it, they won't know because they would have seen it at the car show. So we'll yeah, see what happens. Wait, I had one more question before I get rid of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get rid of me. Uh, <laughs> new Corvette. They keep comparing it to kind of like a Ferrari. Is it that? I mean, I've seen videos on it. I haven't. Have I seen it up close? I don't know. I see so many damn cars. Um, yeah. but is that comparable? I know uh, people talk about it. Is it a beast like they say it is? Cause you know, a lot of times Corvettes, they lose their value like crazy and then they come up with, yes. know, there's always whatever. But what do you, uh, yeah. what's your take I, on I've, that? I've, I've always been a car guy, but I've always been into the foreign car market. Okay. I like Japanese cars. I love German cars. I love Italian cars. Okay. Never was I ever in love with American domestic cars? You know, I'm, you know, nothing against American cars, just not my thing. Yeah. Um, Mustangs have a great history because, you know, they've been around for years and they have that history and that following. Sure. Um, same with Corvette. 1957, I think, was when the first Corvettes came out. You know, the, the C1s um, to all the way to the C7s, front engine, the new C8 rear engine changed the game sure. because of it i guess the weight of the engine in the back with the rear wheel drive the traction for takeoff is incredible so now you're talking about you know if you get that certain package that next level package up 
um, you get bigger brakes and some tweaking on the suspension. Mm -hmm. Your zero to 60 is at 2.9 seconds on a 495 horsepower V8 engine. Whereas Ferrari, which has the V12s front mounted, um, doing about zero to 60, the same thing. And I'm talking about 600 horses, 700 horses. And this is just the base Corvette at starting at 60. And when you get a couple of options, you can get up to about a, a, about 80 grand and still have a car that looks like a McLaren, mm -hmm. looks like a McLaren, keeps up with any of the Ferraris or Porsches out there. They no longer make that car with the stick shift. So it's all paddle shifting and all. Yeah. So I think they borrowed and copied be a little bit of what Porsche has done with their PDK. Hmm. Is they say the speed, when you shift those gears, it's instantaneous, instantaneous, which is what made Porsche really popular with their PDK transmission. Hmm. So this new transmission is incredible. So I tell anyone, if you don't have Uber money to buy a Ferrari or Porsche or anything, jump on that Corvette. You will absolutely love it. I've seen the car a couple of times. I've seen hmm. it on the road. I know one of my guys that we drive with just got one as well. So I'm waiting to see one myself oh. and uh, go, go, you know, go driving with them. Incredible car. Yeah. It looks incredible. That car. It's beautiful. Oh. too. It's beautiful. Yes. yes. Did you see Ford versus Ferrari? That's one of the best movies of the year. You got to go see it. If you didn't, let me tell you, I tried to watch it the other day and then I had to go out and I had to stop. I haven't watched it since. Oh, I think I'm going to watch it today. You will love it. Yeah. It's great. I know. I know. I know the history of Carol, Carol Shelby and Ferrari. I know I knew it prior to the movie coming out, sure. but to watch it, they say I have to watch it, and I think I'm going to watch it today. It's great. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you so much for being on here. You're Anytime. so knowledgeable with this stuff. It's unbelievable. I love uh, talking to you. It's a drug for me. It's yeah, a it drug is for me. So. It is, my man. Yeah. it is. It is. Well, tell your what is that your girlfriend? Is it your wife? Abby. Your Abby. Yeah, tell yes. her. Say hello. I and will. I will. Hopefully, I have you and your partner over as well come and eat abby is a fantastic cook and nothing fits me anymore because of her let's do <laughs> I love it. it let's get <laughs> yes i'm there brother yeah, whatever please. you want please. all right yeah, awesome. anytime and we'll go for a drive in the portion so you can get the feel let's see what you think about it too hell yeah i'm a bad driver i'm hell the, yeah i'm the worst best driver i've always said <laughs> <laughs> that makes any sense. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> That's what I've said about myself. In your mind, you're great. <laughs> I've put millions of miles on cars because I collected money for from basically like 15 years old till I was 40, just driving routes, collecting money in and out of bars, nightclubs, gentlemen's clubs. And then yes. I travel so much, if I'm not flying, I drive. So like I literally spent uh -huh. three weeks driving 7,000 miles. Like it's crazy the miles sometimes I put Yes. On. But I'm the yeah. worst, best driver. I don't know how. I'm all defense, but I'm but I'm bad. I'm a, I just I just think I own the road. I don't care. Too many years behind the wheel. All right, all right brother. Right car for it now. You get get yourself a Porsche. You'll love it. I'll be dead tonight. I like it. <laughs> all right, Ronnie. I will talk to you later, brother. Thank you again. Let's touch base soon. Anytime. All right. Thanks for having me on your show, and uh, I I wish you much success with it. And definitely, anytime you want to talk to me again, I'm always going to be available for you. All right. Thank you so much. All right, brother. Peace out. Sure.